Are men necessary? What does it even mean to be a man? We'll be discussing this and more with author and Professor Tony Esselin right after this. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us to another episode of The Catholic Gentleman, where we are joined, as Sam said, with Dr. Anthony Esselin. Before we introduce him a little bit more, I want to introduce us. We are your co-hosts, Sam Guzman and John Heinen. Uh, We're the individuals behind The Catholic Gentleman. If this is your first time listening, please remember to click that subscribe button, whichever podcast player, or if you're watching us on YouTube, definitely click it there as well on the bell button. Make sure that you get all of these things. If the Catholic Gentleman has inspired you, we'd encourage you to head over to patreon.com slash Catholic Gentleman. Consider donating to us. We want to thank all of our current donors that make this possible. And so diving right in, a little bit of introduction to a man for many who don't, he doesn't need introductions. But for those of you who aren't aware, we've got and very honored to have as our guest today, Dr. Anthony Esselin. He is the author of 28 books and over a thousand articles in both scholarly and general interest journals. A senior editor of Touchstone, a journal of mere Christianity, Dr. Esselin is known for his elegant essays on the faith and his clear social commentaries. And I'll take a pause here and say, I've always loved reading your essays and commentaries throughout the years, actually, because of their wisdom, their directness, and their intelligent humor that you always put into it, uh, including in your book that we'll get to talk about. So continuing on a little bit more as an accomplished poet in his own right, he has, uh, he's known for his widely acclaimed three volume verse translation of Dante's Divine Comedy, which many consider the standard edition for students of Dante. His latest book, which the core message we're going to be discussing today, is No Apologies, Why Civilization Depends on the Strength of Men. And we hope to hear a little bit more about his new online magazine, Word and Song, and we'll get to that at the end of this episode. So again, thank you, Tony, for being with us and joining us on our show today. Well, thanks, guys. It's great to be here. Yeah, and thank you. And so the first question that we always like to start with is tell us a little bit more about your personal life and your personal self. Um, it, I know that you are a, a prolific author. You are definitely an accomplished professor. And I know that you've experienced lifelong physical suffering with the uh, melody of your leg, things that you know are, are public knowledge uh, in the space. But I want to hear from you, uh, you know, a little bit about where you live, what your influences are, and why you decided to, uh, you know, pursue a degree, uh, you know, a career in academia and, you know, writing so many books. Uh, believe it or not, when I was, uh, when I was um, going to Princeton, uh, I initially thought I was going to become a math major, uh, a mathematician, uh, because I love mathematics. I still do. Um, literature took over from there. Um, but I think that the, the, the kinds of literature that I love and the way that I write myself when I, when I write, write poetry, it, there's a deep connection between it and mathematics, the, the connection of complicated structure, um, such as you would find in a, in a medieval cathedral. I think structures like that that are uh, self-referential and complex and intricate, they fascinate me. Just as baseball statistics fascinate okay. me. Um, and uh, uh, so, I, you know, that, so I, I, I said to myself, well, here's here's my ideal here i'm going to make a living being a mathematician while i write poetry um thinking that uh of course you can't make a living writing poetry you have to do something <laughs> that will put bread on the table um and i ended up being a professor of literature teaching mm. the sorts of literature that i love that span uh maybe about three thousand years and many cultures and many languages i always loved languages so that's another thing that's just kind of fit in really well. And I've been doing a lot of translating and writing of poetry too. So this worked out and I still dabble once in a while in mathematical uh, um, mathematical games and so yeah. forth. Uh, but were you uh, 
asking me about what sorts of male influences there were on no you. just yeah exactly what yeah. what inspired you to to become a professor and move in that direction well, the, yeah I, I guess the uh, I, I I don't mean to be flip about being a professor because I always knew that I wanted to be a teacher mm. right and the, the 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 essence of the teacher as far as I can tell is uh, a t- true teacher is the 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 ability to see something that's really good and beautiful and to want to show it to other people, say, come on over here, look at this, mm-hmm. look what I found, okay? Uh, the essence of a teacher is not to change the world. Um, may God save us from politicians parading as teachers, but simply to look at something that's good or great, or beautiful, to look at it in wonder and to be so excited about it that you want to share it with other people. Um, you want to say, come here and look at what I, look at what I found, right? And if the person doesn't quite understand what's going on, then you say, no, no, here, let me show you how this works, right? And uh, that's, that's just a tremendous pleasure. And to see a student's eyes light up as my students did this past year, I'm tr- introducing them to medieval literature and the medieval literature contains uh, kinds of literature that no longer exist. And they're fascinating and a ton of fun too. And every time we would read something at the end of it, I, I, I'd say, hey, okay, guys, you tell me again, have you ever read anything that is like this? I'm not talking about greatness, but this is even in the same category with this. Yeah. And again and again, they would say, no, we never knew that a kind of literature like this even existed. And that's just a, that's just a grand thing. Um, it is. I, I, yeah. I love that sort of thing. I just had a conversation today, actually, with my nephew, who's 17, goes to a classical liberal arts education, you know, school here in Dallas, Fort Worth. And he's been experiencing that with Shakespeare as of recently. Yeah. Every time he reads something new of Shakespeare, he's just blown away by the depth of his understanding of the human person. And you tell him that he's still scratching the surface. (laughs) You read Shakespeare 40 times and you're teaching it in class. And while you are pronouncing the words that you've pronounced many a time before, it suddenly strikes you that you missed something that's right mm-hmm. there in front of you. Um, that's how great it is. Does he go to Cistercian by any chance? No, he doesn't. Uh, he goes to Great Hearts. Um, oh, okay. That's in, yeah. But Cistercian, we know people are there. Oh, great. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's wonderful. I actually find that relationship between... Uh, uh, numbers and your kind of your what your, your vocation uh, as a professor is very interesting because, as we know, like we, we kind of the resurgence of classical education, there's been this focus on uh, the trivium uh, of logic, right. grammar, and rhetoric. But we know that you know in the ancient world there was also the quadrivium that right. built on that, which was which was numbers and geometry and astronomy and music and. And uh, so there's like a, there's a qualitative aspect to numbers, not just quantitative. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit more about how your love of mathematics has informed that. I'd love to hear a little bit more about well, that. Um, you know, the old, the old uh, word for uh, writing in metered poetry was numbers, mm-hmm. right? I lisped in numbers for the numbers came says Alexander Pope, describing Mm. his own youth when he's a poet. Um, Oh, yes. Well, my wife now (laughs) brings this book for me to pump, okay? The Hundredfold, which is a book-long poem made up of 100 poems, uh, Songs for the Lord, set set in the time of Jesus, right? 12 dramatic monologues. If you want to know, uh, if you want to, uh, a a dramatic presentation of... uh, uh, St. Peter on that dreadful night when he had denied the Lord, but before the glory of the resurrection, w- w- he went aside and he wept bitterly. What was mm. he thinking? Okay. Yeah. That's one of the monologues in, in, oh. in this here. And it's all organized with excruciatingly detailed mathematics. Um, D- Dante did the same thing in his Divine Comedy. We've stopped doing that. But the old poets... The old poets believed, if they were writing a great poem, that in some fashion they were 
imitating the structure of the universe itself. Mm -hmm. And God made the world, in that verse that St. Augustine was very fond of quoting, and that entered the minds of poets, God made the world in measure, weight, and number. And um, so if you as a poet or an architect or an artist, right, um, if you want to give glory to God, then you too should make things in measure, weight, and number. And they did. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, don't, I mean, I could get into that forever. You would be astonished by the, uh, by the uh, precise numerological and mathematical structure of Renaissance and medieval poems that you know, you just first read for the for the story, and you have no idea that this structure is even there, but it's there. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you discover that too, it's like like <laughs> an explosion in your mind. Like, like um, I remember, yeah. uh, I have a book called the, the Plan of Saint Gall, and it's like this whole this medieval monastery architectural plans that it was never actually built, but they like drew out the plans for it, and they were gonna yeah. build it. But I remember reading like how the distance between like the the altar and like the back wall of the abbey or the, the monastery they're building there was like precisely like 40 like there was like 40 units or measure or something like that and it was like right. a, a symbol of purification like i just I mean, my mind was blown like just how seriously yeah, they yeah. took that. no they took it very seriously and once you start seeing things you can't stop yeah. uh, i'll give i'll give you two examples um and i want to say something about boys and this sort of thing because it relates to uh, uh, some of the material in this book here no apologies um, first one is a simple thing uh, if you go to uh, you see uh, medieval and renaissance baptistries and ba baptismal fonts um, you will often find that they are octagonal okay mm -hmm. and you may wonder why they're octagonal uh, for a variety of reasons first because saint augustine says that the eighth day he says this at the end of the city of God, the eighth day is that Sabbath beyond the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath of the resurrection of the flesh. And there is a morning to that and no evening. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and the, so the eighth day, the eight then becomes the symbol of resurrection into eternal life. But eight is also the number, says St. Peter, in uh, one of the letters of St. Peter, is the number of souls saved in the ark. Noah, Mrs. Noah, his three sons and their three wives. And therefore the church, the ark of Noah is a foreshadowing of the church and baptism wow. in the church is his entry into the church. So the church, the baptismal font of Baptist, Bapt baptistries like the baptistry in Florence are octagonal to suggest that if you go in there, you are going to be, you are going to be admitted to the ark, right? You are going to be one of the eight, yeah, uh, awaiting that eighth day. Uh, I mean, this just the other the other example I'll give you um, is is much more complicated. It was only rediscovered, uh, gosh, about seventy years ago by by a critic, because modern people had forgotten this sort of thing. Um, when Edmund Spencer, late late 16th century English poet, uh, married for the second time, he was a widower. He married uh, a, a younger woman when he's about I don't know, about 40 years old. Um, he gave to her a, a, a wedding present, part of which was a beautiful wedding hymn to celebrate the day of their marriage. Okay, um, this wedding hymn is organized according to 24 stanzas. Uh, to um, represent the hours of the day. The 24 stanzas are made of long lines and short lines. There are exactly 365 long lines. The short lines are 68, that is 52 weeks plus 12 months plus four seasons. At the latitude where he was married, and he makes a big point of this because he was married on the longest day of the year. He was married on the summer solstice. And he says in the poem, that was the dumbest day to get married on um, because it's the longest day of the year. The shortest day would have been better, but no matter how long the day is, it's going to come to an end. And sure enough, at that latitude, there's a certain amount of sunlight, daylight. The sun is above the, uh, the horizon. And at precisely the proportion that would 
apply to the number of lines that he's written in the poem, right? That is exactly where he says, um, day is done, okay? Wow. Um, and he's thinking also about latitude because of the tilt of the Earth's axis, which is 23 and a fraction degrees. And that's why 23 of the stanzas resemble each other, but the final stanza is only fractional. Wow. And he says that uh, in the end that he's giving this gift to his bride, um, uh, it is itself incomplete, he says, but, uh, but let it be for her uh, um, for short time an endless monument. Wow. Right? And that's just scratching the surface there, okay? I was still scratching the surface there. Um, now, uh, I mean, this is the sort of thing that boys and men do yeah. when you let them go crazy. Um, and I've mentioned this in, in the book here, right? I mean, one of the peculiarities of, of, of men and boys, it seems to me, is that wherever you find them, even if they're not particularly good at mathematics, wherever you find them, you find, you find rankings and numbers, okay? And wherever you find rankings, lots of rankings and numbers, you're going to find men and boys. Mm. Um, the, the, the boys are the sex that would stare at the back of a baseball card. Yeah. As if it were a thing of wonder. And it is, in fact, a thing of wonder. I mean, when you think about it, look at all of the events that get compiled to make up statistics on the back of a card. Now they, you have websites where literally uh, every player will be associated on the page with about a thousand numbers. Mm. And those numbers themselves have been compiled from many, many each one from many uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of events. Uh, it's, um, and the, I mean, the, the men are the, the uh, and boys are the sex that say, isn't that great? Yes. Uh, it's football inspiring. rankings, you know? Uh, <laughs> I agree. So actually on that point, this is a great opportunity. So um, the, moving into the direction of, of the content of your book here is that uh, Sam and I have talked about this frequently. That there's actually not many books out there written uh, like and for the audience that, you, that you're intentionally writing for right here. We've talked about it. I've had vocation directors. We get um, people who shoot us emails asking, um, hey, do you have a book that just kind of talks about the core characteristics of a man, what it means to be a man? You know, I need to. And I had a, a vocation director recently up in um, the New York area uh, reach out and tell me that he's like, you know, I never thought that I would ever have to add that into my teaching within the vocation, yeah. you know, uh, in the priesthood here and brothers and things like that. And he's like, but I really need to, like, I really need something that's good that reminds men what it means to be a man. And so I'd like to ask you, what were the building blocks that ultimately are the ultimate cat catalyst that, uh, you know, inspired you to the, or in, um, I would say motivated you to write this book, uh, for men. And I know you start out with, uh, you know, a book that, you never thought you'd have to write um, or shouldn't need yeah. to be written, but but is. So I'd love to hear that from you. Oh, well, there are a slew of books these days that should never have yeah. had to be written, right? Yeah. Uh, and some of the great uh, minds of our time have had their time taken up and their efforts, I think, in some ways wasted because they have to do things that shouldn't have to be done. I'm thinking of the great Robert George, for example. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there are arguments yes. that should not have to be made about, for instance, the humanity of the child in the womb. Um, I, I have a heart for um, uh, lost souls in schools, mm. right? And because uh, I suffered in them uh, to a certain extent when I was a kid too. Um, and boys these days are being treated with absolute shabbiness. Um, not to say that they're saints because they're not, but they are completely neglected, it appears to me. Um, and when they have to hear all the time that there's something gross or stupid about their very sex, then that then somebody's got to say, you got to stop this. It's one thing if you tell it to grown men, they can laugh it off, you know. Uh, but when you tell it to boys, boys are vulnerable, and that's disgusting, okay. So here I am writing a book to remind men of some basic truths, not to be, and, and to let themselves be fooled no longer. Um, 
and especially then to have this inform how they raise their sons and what kinds of schools they send those boys to and what their teachers should be like, or what they should be reading uh, or what, what films they should be watching, you know, what the kinds of things that they should be doing outdoors. Mm -hmm. I've been told lately that there are a lot of things wrong with our infrastructure. Uh, our pipelines are getting old, for instance. And uh, we're facing a problem because there aren't enough skilled laborers to do the work that's necessary. We, we, we should be building nuclear power plants. They are now clean. France leads in the world technology, in world technology, nuclear power plant. France of all places. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you wouldn't think, right? Uh, pate de foie gras, yeah, sure, but a nuclear power plant, uh. <laughs> um, But they, they lead the world in nuclear technology and we're, we haven't built a new nuclear reactor in, in more than 50 years, mm -hmm. uh, about 50 years. But where are you going to get the workers who are capable of doing it? The men are not being raised up who do this. Um, and if they're not there, it's not gonna get done, okay? Uh, I mean, still a lot of these jobs do require um, a willingness to be at great risk of life or limb. And they do require some physical strength. And frankly, they require the kind of kind of spirit or the kind of mind that would even be interested in, in stuff like this. You know? um, and if you're not raising men who will do it, then it's not going to get done. And we, we're starting to see, right, where our, our infrastructure is crumbling uh, everywhere we look, right? We look like a third world country in some places. Mm -hmm. um, train, old train stations, for instance, before you actually get to the train station, you, you, you go through underpass after underpass, culvert, past culvert, and it's rotting, it's falling apart, it's uh, defaced by graffiti, it's disgusting, it's overgrown, it, it basically needs to be dealt with. It needs to be dealt with by people who have a good lot of physical strength and who are willing to do uncomfortable, grimy, and sometimes risky work. In other words, men. And if the men are not there to do it, it's not going to get done. Uh, I mean, that, that's just a small example, but I, I'm trying to tell men, don't be fooled anymore, okay? Yeah. And don't let your sons be taken advantage of that way. We need to, we need to raise sons who are, who are able to get married. If you're, you're raising your son the way that the boys are being raised these days, they're not marriageable, right? Yeah. They're not marriageable. They don't have any. They don't have any remunerable skills because nobody's bothered with them. Um, they get sucked into the internet. That's a black hole. Yeah. Nothing good for a child ever comes out of the internet. Yeah. Um, nothing good, right? Let's get rid of that. You know, and you men know better, right? I can say to men, "What are you kidding?" You, you think your kid is actually, you think your kid is learning higher mathematics on that computer. You know darn right well what that kid is looking at that computer when your back is turned. You know it, yeah. but you're too negligent or you don't want to stand up to, to say, no, you put that thing away, get rid of it, smash it with a hammer. Go outside and, and, and learn how to do things with your hands, with your back, with your brains too. Uh, anyway, so... I'm writing this book um, for people who have been bamboozled and especially for young men and boys that really need to grow up to be responsible and strong, productive men, or otherwise we're done for. Yeah. Agreed. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think there's a, um, a growing awareness among men that something's missing. I think a lot of people, struggle to articulate what that missing piece is and that's why books like yours are so important because it gives words to kind of like a intuition or a vague feeling that people might have but then when they read something like your book that's like oh that's what i've been feeling all along but i want to kind of talk about something you mentioned so you mentioned okay. like this aspect of physical labor you know, uh, adversity, like a willingness to plunge into danger, like just do right. those grimy, dirty, dangerous jobs. Um, and how men are, you know, typically much more willing to do that than, than women are or traditionally, at least. Yes. But I'm I not, to, if, I may, if I may interrupt here, it's not just tradition. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's simple, flat physical capacity. Yes. Uh, the other day I found out by accident because I was searching for something else 
that the force of an arm, let's say an arm plying a sledgehammer mm-hmm. or an arm swinging an axe, but the arm used as an armature or as a lever, is uh, the, the force of that is proportional to its length to the fourth power. Um, that means that if human beings were even somewhat smaller than they are, we would not be here right now. Okay? Yeah. Because there would have been no quarries, no foundries, um, no mines, no chopping down of trees, no hewing of hardwoods or even the softer wood. There'd be none of that. Not be possible. In other words, um, even if men, males, were significantly shorter than they are, none of that would have gotten done. And men are stronger than teenage boys by far, mm. as every teenage boy knows. And teenage boys are stronger than their mothers. You can draw forth the implications there. If men were only as strong as women are physically, then we would not be here, right? That's yeah, not the yeah. tradition, simple capacity. That tree, that tree is going to ruin the ax and your hands are going to be a bloody mess um, if you don't have sufficient force to get past the threshold to allow you to apply strokes to the tree that are effectual, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And, and I think that's part of the illusion of the modern world is like a lot of boys and young men grow up being kind of buffered from those physical realities in which their sex would be affirmed Right. And and would be necessary, but they go right. through their entire life never experiencing that necessity. So, you know, someone else is doing it, you know, or whatever. And so they just aren't never come face to face with that yeah. like, physical it, necessity of their it, sex. It's a total yeah. shame. It's total yeah. shame because it builds up the body, but not only the body, it builds up the hands and the mind, right? Yeah. I, I recall a story, I believe I mentioned it in the book here. Um, the, uh, the, the Quaker lad who grew up to be the father of gynecology in the United States and the first great anti-abortion crusader in the 19th century Mm -hmm. became a Catholic at age 39, but he was the crusader before he became Catholic. His name was Horatio Storer. And he was sent by his parents to a Quaker school in Cape Cod, uh, a boarding school. And he writes home all the time. We have his letters. Okay. They're, They're fascinating. And he was about 12 years old. One day, I think the schoolmaster had been sick for a while. So the boys had a few free days in a row. And uh, they got it into their heads. Let's build a log cabin. Right? Let's build a log cabin. So they got the saws uh, from the schoolmaster. They got some hatchets. And there were older teenage boys there with some strength. Um, Everybody had to test it. And they built a log cabin. Took them a couple of days. They built a log cabin. And they put a flag on it in honor of William Henry Harrison, the president of that time. Uh, and imagine that. Imagine you, you, you're, you're, you're talking then to your son and you say, you know what I did? Okay. That's what I did. See that over there? I made that. And the son says, wow, I want to do that. Okay. Um. And uh, you, you'll, know, you'll notice that there are no such boys who are confused about their sex. Right? Amish boys growing up, working alongside their big brothers, their father, their uncles, right, with all the other boys, dressed as boys, working along with the other boys, with the men, have no confusion at all about their sex. Right. Yeah. Right. And they all get married once they hit 19 or 20. And they all have big broods of children. And, you know, you see these guys uh, um, with their beards, because once you get married, you're allowed to grow a beard. Um, And they'd be in their 20s, cheerful, you know, tall, skinny, cheerful Amish guy. And you know that though he only weighs maybe 150 pounds there, you know, because of the labor that he's done, you can see it in the hands, you see it in the neck. You know that he could wipe the floor with just about anybody. (laughs) Yeah, well, and, uh, and they're not so, confused. They're not confused. No, and th- and that's kind of what I want to ask next is just kind of so we started the conversation off with kind of this the intellectual wonder yeah. and the the numbers and things that boys are tra- attracted to the the order and the ranks and right. and um and then also there's this this 
So there's intellectual culture, but then there's also this physical culture. Right. Um, and, 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 our, and, you know, in our world today, it feels like those are completely divided from one another in the sense that you're either an intellectual, which you just, you just kind of let your body atrophy, um, right. or you're, or you're a gym rat and you're, you have a huge muscular body, but you maybe let your mind go. Yeah. And, a, a muscular body that would not last one round in the ring with a construction worker. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, it's not the same what you want, what we want to do is put these two things together. Yeah. And in fact, this is the this is the history of uh, men building the things that make civilization possible. Right. And they do have to do with one another. OK. I, I mention in the book uh, 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 tasks. Right. Um, so, for instance, you. Um, you live in New York City in the last half of the 19th century, and um, you can no longer get sufficient water for everybody in that city. The population is too great. Um, people had collected water from roofs of tenements to cisterns, rainwater. That was not sufficient. They had piped in water from a dam uh, uh, in uh, you know across the across the. Um, across the Long Island Sound there, uh, you know, a little bit in, you know, real New York, <laughs> uh, upstate New York. And uh, that was proving insufficient. So they needed a new dam. Um, and an article in Century Magazine that I, I've read, a very long article, very involved, describes the construction of the dam and then the aqueduct hmm. that, that would take, that took the water underground 20 miles into New York City and all the separate things that had to be um, installed along the way of this aqueduct uh, so that the water wouldn't back up, so that uh, things wouldn't get clogged, um, so that there would be sufficient pressure to get the water there. The water had to be piped down below the Hudson River and then back up again uh, into, into, into New York City. So how to how to sink the aqueduct under the Hudson and then back up and provide enough pressure so that water will be siphoned up, right? Uh, enormous architectural, engineering, mathematical, structural, hierarchical undertaking, okay? And all the men who were part of this, even the most, even the ordinary workers are partaking in something that is a lot more like the construction of a cathedral, okay, than it is like, you know, uh, I don't know, almost anything that uh, that a kid will do nowadays, right? Um, that thing doesn't get done without masterminds, right? But it can't just be one mastermind. Everybody's got to share in this in some ways. Right? There have got to be mini masterminds, subordinate masterminds, and then the men themselves doing the labor. They've got to come to understand why this particular thing has to be done this way. Right? Um, all kinds of intelligence is involved and hierarchy. Hierarchy in the structure itself because some things are subordinated to other things, but hierarchy in, in uh, uh, all of the building crews. And that's the kind of thing that is it seems to me men and boys are drawn to. Uh, I've called it the team in the book. Yeah. Team yeah. is not just a group of people doing the same thing, and then you pull it all together. That That's additive. A team is a complex organization where each person is doing a separate task that means nothing by itself, okay? Um, but it is all coordinated towards the accomplishment of something beyond them all that is complex, right? Any football play, the the thing that any person, one person does in a football play is meaningless. Hmm. It's only in the context of the whole thing that it has meaning, right? Um, uh, What an Indian kid might do, uh, shouting at a bunch of buffaloes means nothing. But if the boys are organized in that spot, particularly that spot to do that hollering uh, because there are other men in this other spot 
uh, to be setting some fires, perhaps, and there are other men at some other spot to be shooting arrows, and other men down at the bottom of the embankment because that's where they're intending to to get the buffalo to uh, crash, right, to run off a precipice to their death so they can get not just one straggling buffalo, but a whole bunch of them at once. Right? What the boy is doing is no meaning at all. What any one person may be doing has no meaning, but it's the whole thing. It's very complicated and strategic that produces the, uh, the effect. And that thing structurally is like what, um, uh, what, a, what, what baseball is, what football is, what a construction crew is, uh, what uh, an architect and his crew are doing, what mathematics is. Um, right. It's, 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 this, it's, uh, it's a way of thinking that the, that can become too abstract and that's its danger. Right. So men can often miss the trees for the forest. Mm -hmm. They can see too far and not notice the people and the things that are right in front of them. Okay. Women will almost never miss the things that are right in front of them. If you ever meet a woman who is abstracted all the time, you're meeting a very strange woman. Um, it, it, she'll immediately strike you. Oh, that's, that's a very weird woman. Um, but women, women will, you know, the problem there is that they may miss the forest for the trees, or they may be so involved with the welfare of the particular people right in front of them that they miss uh, the whole thing or long range implications of what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so what we need is, of course, we need these two things in concert because the men are only doing the thing that they're doing for the sake of the common good and for the sake of women and children. Um, right. So in that sense that they are subordinate to the women and children in other senses, the women and the children are subordinate to them. Um, people used to know these things. I shouldn't have to explain them, you know, people used to know. And this is true wherever you go in human civilizations. A, ch a traditional Chinese person would reckon, he would say, yeah, sure, that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Aboriginal hunters in Australia, they'd say, yeah, yeah, that's the way it is, you know? Yeah, I completely agree. And I would say another thing, and I want to I want to hear from you on this matter. Another thing that is uh, people used to understand is, uh, and it, we've been alluding to it, and you have a whole chapter devoted to it in your book. And I feel we here at the Catholic Gentleman we've argued very frequently that it's it can never be overstated, uh, and often is understated. In fact, especially within the institutional church, it's uh, you know unfortunately ignored, and that is the issue of the father right and right. your chapter uh on the family in particular that section on no fathers no hope you know gives a, a real direct you know gut punch to the importance of of fathers and the the lack of fathers and how it's linked to the moral decay and societal decay that we see around us and i just want to take a moment and and hear you talk about the importance of fathers and we've got a lot of fathers that listen in and a lot of you know uh, hopeful fathers if you will um and so I'd love to hear you talk some more about that aspect uh, within a family unit, but most importantly, within society. Uh, when they're good fathers, they're towers of strength. My mother never had to worry about anything when my father was there. My father died relatively young. Uh, he died at age 56, mm -hmm. cancer. Um, I was only 31 when he died. Uh, but w when he was alive, my mother never had to worry, worry about anything. He didn't bring his home, work home with him. He didn't bother uh, bother her with things that undoubtedly would have bothered him. Um, and, you know, he he shrugged it off. Um, uh, things needed to get done; they got done. Uh, there was no worry, right? Mm. And he was a good provider, and it made for a good, solid home. Um, you <laughs> you didn't have anything to fear. Okay, dad was there. Um, I, it's I, I wonder about people sometimes. It's as if they think our prisons are not full enough as it is. We incarcerate a tremendously large percentage of our population. Not to say that they don't commit the crimes for which they are incarcerated, but why should there be so many? Um, well, our prisons are basically full of fatherless guys, yeah. right? We know this too. We've known this for 30 years, right? That the single factor that 
is most co uh, strongly correlated with doing prison time in the United States is whether you it is that you did not grow up with a married father in home when you were a kid, okay, uh, all the time that you were a kid. If if the answer to that is no, then that correlates with doing prison time more than income, more than race, more than level of education, right? And still, we, we, we've known this for decades. So we won't want to do anything about it because uh, to do anything about it, we would have to acknowledge that boys need to be paid attention to so that they can become decent men and not uh, slobs, layabouts, thugs, cads, right? But actually responsible pillars of the community so that we women can find them and marry them and they can have kids and things be healthy and sound and happy again, instead of miserable such as they are. I mean, it's absolutely necessary and the church doesn't talk enough about it. Yes. So the church assumes the church assumes with the world out there um, that um, you know the boys and men they'll take care of themselves. Well, how's that worked? Okay. Um, the, one of the magazines I, I write for, Touchstone, uh, they published um, a study many years ago, very strange study uh, out of Switzerland that uh, showed that if you were a kid in a family and the father went to religious services every week, but your mother did not. You were almost certain growing up to go to religious services. But if your mother went to religious services and your father did not growing up in the same home, then you were almost certain not to go to religious services when you grew up. That influence. Mm -hmm. The influence is, is tremendous. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and yet still we pretend, oh yeah, we need, we, need, you know, our, the churches, the Christian churches in the West are full of old ladies yes. and still we pretend, yeah, we need to do something about the women. We need to hear more about the women. Uh, I would like the, the bishops of the United States of America just once to get together to write something sensible and strong about boys and their vocation to one kind of fatherhood or another, either to get married and have children or to become priests. The big vocations crisis in our time right now is marriage, not priesthood. Um, priesthood has, you know, taken a couple of punches to the gut, but marriage is in free fall. Um, and if grace perfects nature, you got to have the natural foundation. And we don't have that anymore. Yeah. Nobody's paying any attention. Um, uh, it, 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 it's as if the bishops thought that they would offend every woman in the church if they spent even one minute talking about the special gifts and the special needs of boys and young men. Yeah. And I never hear it. So, and I, I want like everything you're saying is absolutely true. And I, and we see like the correlation between fatherlessness and a host of negative consequences. But let's say you hadn't, like, you didn't have a father in the picture, and but right. yet you see the need and you say, I want to be a good dad, but I don't know, I don't have a template. Like, I don't know what that looks like. I don't even know what a loving father is. So what would you say to somebody who's listening to this and who says, yes, I want to be that guy. I want to be that pillar of strength, but I didn't have that. Uh, and how would, how would you respond to that? Well, uh, a few things. First, um, first you can uh, hang around good fathers, okay? Maybe even an uncle, okay? Um, and these days, nobody has uncles anymore either uh, or aunts, right? Everybody's got these tiny little families. Uh, my wife and I, each one of us had 28 aunts and uncles. Wow. Um, I have 39 first cousins. My wife uh, had 43 first cousins. And half of my good. first cousins lived in my hometown. Wow. Um, I saw them all the time, played with them all the time. I knew my uncles. Okay. Um, so that there, there is a possibility. The other possibilities. So, so the one possibility is find a father. Yeah. You didn't have one, but find one. Uh, find one emulate. Okay. 
Uh, and uh, uh, two other things to sort of uh, at least make an attempt to begin to remedy the loss. There are old books and there are classic movies. Okay. Um, classic movies make no, uh, pl classic movies are not embarrassed to show both good fathers and bad fathers and to show why they're good and great and why they're bad. Okay. They're not politically correct. Uh, How Green Was My Valley is one of the, our, my family's favorite movies, if not our very favorite. And um, the, the, the patriarch and the matriarch of the Morgan family are completely masculine and completely feminine. And they are, to, they are forces to be reckoned with, okay? Um, what does it mean there to be, to be a father? It's shown in the father in the movie, Gula Morgan, and in the preacher in the movie, Mr. Griffiths. Uh, but there are other, I mean, there are other books and movies like that, right? Um, the uh, fatherhood is a big feature in um, Sigurd Unset's book, The Master of Hestvigen, um, uh, Olaf there, he's got some problems as a father, but he is a father. Uh, the, the, maybe the best presentation of a father in modern Catholic literature is the, is the patriarch in her other great novel, this is actually a trilogy, Kristen Lavran's daughter, um, Kristen's father, Lavran's, is the epitome of uh, of Christian Christian masculinity, Christian manliness, and um, generous and kindly and far-seeing fatherliness. Right, um, an example of fatherliness in a priest. Maybe the greatest example in the history of literature is in Alessandro Manzoni's novel, The Betrothed. 19th century Italian novel, the greatest Italian novel ever written. Um, Brother Cristoforo um, is the uh, is the fatherly, manly, protective, stern, kindly, totally self-sacrificing, wise and loving uh, spiritual center of the of that novel. But also the Cardinal Archbishop of Milan. Federigo Borromeo, cousin of St. Charles Borromeo, because it's a historical novel, so that yeah. there's um, historical characters. He, he and his role as a the fatherly archbishop, cardinal archbishop, is a perfect model for fatherliness in the priesthood, too, okay? Uh, though he's less central to the book. He's very important in the book. The, uh, brother Christopher, Father Christopher, uh, it's a great portrayal. You, you, you read old books. Um, read old books before people got got sick in the head. Yeah. Um, the Yearling, book written by a woman. Uh, not a comfortable book to read. Hmm. Um, but the father in that book. Uh, that. The, the, the woman writes this book and her heart is not with the wife in the book, but with the husband, a great character and a great and wise father, kindly, perhaps sometimes a little bit too indulgent with his son, but not that much either. And that son has to grow up to be a man. Uh, growing up to be men, right? that, that was a standard story. Yeah. In our own literature, standard story everywhere you go in the world, every culture. Captain's Courageous by Rudyard Kipling is another boy to man story. Kim by Ru Rudyard Kipling set in India, another boy to man story with a father figure. Both cases, a father figure. Okay, In Captain's Courageous, it's the uh, skipper of a schooner that this rich kid boy got saved by off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. And he ends up spending months on the schooner. This is the day before cell phones. Nobody could get word to his mother or father that he was still alive because he'd fallen off the cruise ship. Um, and while he, when he's on this schooner, he learns not to be a spoiled rich brat anymore, but to be a real man. And when his father gets him back after the months on the schooner, he realizes that he's gotten back a man. 
not not a spoiled kid anymore, not not a boy that he didn't even like to be around. And the, that father himself starts to come into his own. Um, so, you know, th these things, these things are out there. Uh, they were standard for people. And now we have we have silly feminist uh, fantasies um, where the sexes don't even like each other anymore. Um, don't trust each other. So you have what's absolute nonsense, the idea that, that women could be swinging swords and beating up people on the battlefield. Uh, sorry, but uh, that's not happening. Um, and um, nor would anybody let it happen because first they wanted to win battles. And second, why are you fighting a battle in the first place if not to protect your women and your children? That's, that's insane. Yeah. The, the women and children are not expendable. You are, right? You're expendable. Yeah. You're absolutely necessary because you're expendable. <laughs> the women are indispensable, not mm -hmm. expendable. So you don't send them out. The, the, the population of the next generation is going to be determined by the number of women, not by the number of men. I mean, in the old days, yeah. uh, before, before mon monogamy, okay? Mm -hmm. You could afford to lose some men. Uh, you couldn't afford to lose women your population would sink. Uh, so the men are expendable. The men, and men in a deep sense know this, that they know, you know what? Um, I am not of ultimate importance. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so important. Yeah. If that makes sense. It does. There's so many great points to reflect on. I really appreciate you doing that. And I want to take uh, for my final question, we'll definitely have a little bit of time to talk about um, your your online magazine and a little bit more of the book. But I actually want to hear you talk um, about where do we go from here as men? Like um, that was great uh, example of fathers and and ways that men can or fa young fathers can grow in better understanding their um, worth and their value and how to maybe improve upon that, obviously. But, you know, what do you find is the solution for our society going forward? And what would you like to leave us men and the predominant listeners on our podcast, our men, um, with uh, today? Okay. Uh, in no particular order, all right? Yeah. Get yourselves outdoors. God gave you hands. Do things with them. He gave you shoulders and a back. Don't let them go to waste, okay? Learn. If you don't know how to build, learn to build, okay? And do it. Um, do it with your sons and do it with other men if it's if it's a big thing right get together men belong in teams okay men in the church you get together uh for what for what uh uh talking about books that you've read that's okay i have no problem with that how about getting together in order to build something with your hands mm -hmm. right and your backs something that would be visible and would last and would be there for 100 years how about doing that? Um, Amish, you say you can't do that. Amish people do that all the time, right? A bunch of Amish men will get together, build your barn in one day, okay? Um, so, so get out there, learn, it, um, learn to do things. Get your sons out of the poisonous atmospheres, okay? Um, they're going to be corrupted by that, and they're not going to be marriageable. Yeah. Uh, that means get them away from the screens, throw the computer away. Kid doesn't need a computer. Kid does not need a computer. Stop fooling yourself, okay? Stop using it as babysitter or an excuse. Kid does not need the computer. Get him away from that, all right? Um, and uh, uh, have him read good books. Watch the old classic movies. Um, if the school worries, if it's a public school, public school is almost certainly filled with poison, okay? Get him out of there. They don't say, well, you know, 90% of it is good. You want to eat a meal that is 90% wholesome and 10% arsenic? I don't want to eat that meal. You know, uh, the, the meal is 90% good, but the 10% is uh, 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 the droppings that I got from the dog outside in the yard. Yeah, but, they're, you know, they're just sprinkled around here. But the other part is, I don't want that meal. Okay. Uh, the poison does a lot of harm. Get the, kid, get the kids out of there. Um, uh, it, it start not being embarrassed anymore you've got this strength use it 
and you've got a certain farsightedness, uh, and again, the danger is that you will miss things in front of you, but use it too. Don't be fooled, okay? And right, that, that, I guess that that's that's just part of part of my advice there. Um, have more fun, and uh, don't j- let it all be reading groups. Take action, okay? Amen. Thank you. Make the boys part of it, and so the boys will grow up to be men who can get married young, and we can start have a decent society again. Right? This does not happen anymore by accident. Uh, in old days, you could go. It, it, the default was there. Well, it's no longer there, so we have to be deliberate about it. But what you have to do, you have to do. So you do it. And now, can I talk a little bit about word and song? Absolutely. Well, do. Sam, did please you do. have any? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Please do. We want to hear word and song. Uh, all of this, I'll just let our listeners know. I'm going to put in the show notes, so I'll be going through this, and I'll be putting in that that great yeah. litany, et cetera. You know, a couple of your books, I'll throw in there. Um, oh yeah. And and so yeah, please share with us this new project, uh, this new online magazine that you're working on. Yes. So um, it's called Word and Song. Uh, it's a Substack. Um, there is free content, but there's also content that we uh, give only to paid subscribers. Um, it won't be like, it's not like anything else I think that's out there. So every week, right, every week there is a word of the week, and that is uh, can be just in print or audio. You can get me you know, talking about the word. So it's a foray into the history of our language, uh, uh, into what a word is you know, used to mean, what, what it means now, how that happened. You know, people I think are, are fascinated by words. Um, so there's, that, that happens once a week, right? There's a hymn of the week. Uh, and I take a classic hymn, not, um, uh, you know, not, 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 not the twaddle uh, of the last uh, several decades, but be classic gather hymn, us like, in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they gather <laughs> us in the nice and the naughty. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but a classic hymn like Praise to the Holiest in the Height or The King of Love My Shepherd Is. Um, and I discuss it briefly. I say, you know, this is why this is a great hymn. This, look what's going on here. So I try to teach people how to read hymns, and they will typically be linked with uh, um, uh, a choral uh, rendition of the hymn, so some choir uh, singing hymn. There will be a film recommendation of the week um, with a link. And uh, so there I'll try to introduce everybody to a classic film and uh, talk about why, you know, th- this is something good to watch, what's going on here. Um, brief, brief discussion, right? And then there is the most important part, there's poetry, okay? So, um, so every week there will be a poem of the week, which uh, I will uh, give in print version, but I will also talk about and read audio, okay? And you don't really read a poem unless you don't really have a poem unless you hear it yeah uh, and there would be longer poetry podcasts only for subscribers um and uh there there i might read a long thing okay that otherwise maybe you won't get to what you want to hear what's satan's what are some of satan's speeches like in paradise lost well i'm going to give you them okay talk a little bit about them then give them and there will be uh, also for subscribers, there will be podcasts of um, articles that I've written from the past uh, that, you know, are just out there floating in interspace somewhere, but um, bring, bring them back. Time to bring them all together. Yeah, exactly. Bring, yeah. 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 And yeah. Uh, so I'm looking for an audience of um, all Christians of goodwill. Um, and everyone else too. Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. A lot of fun. So it'd be a lot of fun. I have fun. Uh, so it's not yeah. going to be given to politics and being angry. It's yeah. going to be given to uh, words, hymns, films, poems, and I'm excited about them. And uh, uh, boy, you ought to hear me do Satan. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, that sounds like our kind of stack there. I'm, I'm grateful for you sharing that and for you too, for that undertaking. That'll be wonderful. Yeah, John and I were talking the other day about just the necessity for for men to have a culture, an awareness of yeah. culture and different ideas and different uh, books and, and literature and, and you know, films and, and just the the incredible wealth of knowledge that human beings have produced. So 
just last question is in regard to how this new project will nurture that. Um, like, could you speak briefly about the importance of just being a cultured man and just having a, a well-developed mind? Yeah, well, for one thing, you can't be fooled, okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to know a little bit of history or to know a little bit of uh, classic literature, poetry, especially because poetry, it gets, you get it in really concentrated form. Mm. It, it might take you an entire winter in Russia where winters are the longest, to read the brothers Karamazov, okay, yeah. uh, my, my favorite novel of all time, but it'll take you only five minutes to read a short, a uh, lyric poem by the the greatest lyric poem poet in English, in my opinion, George Herbert, a uh, Christian a religious poet, and you have it for the rest of your life, right? Um, so this the, the poetry is the nitroglycerin that blows the hole through the mountain to to dig the tunnel through. It, it's 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 the great driver of the imagination. And and boys and men used to be filled with this. Okay, I, I give an anecdote in the book. Right, so this was I can't remember the exact year. Uh, it was in the 1870s, I believe, sometime, and uh, it was February in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So you have to imagine kind of miserable weather. But a bunch of boys got together and they decided to knock on the door of somebody who they knew lived there, but they had never met him before. Uh, the somebody was their favorite poet, Henry Longfellow, Henry Wadsworth mm, Longfellow. Yeah. And they knew he was 75 years old. It was his birthday that day. So they just wanted to knock on his door and wish him happy birthday and say to him, we love your poems. Okay. Bunch of boys, right? This, this story is like seems to come from a different universe. Well, Longfellow was there. Longfellow always liked kids. So we invited them in. They spent the whole afternoon. They talked about poetry. They talked about other things they were interested in as boys. Longfellow talked to them. Uh, they had scones and tea, and everybody enjoyed themselves. They said goodbye. Uh, that was the last birthday Longfellow ever had on earth. In a few weeks, he had he passed away. Okay. Now, um, those boys had a living and vibrant imagination. Their, their imaginations were formed by what they read from Longfellow. And what they read from Longfellow wasn't a bunch of sissy stuff, and it wasn't a bunch of, you know, politically correct stuff. It wasn't. It was. It was stuff to fill your blood. It was patriotic poetry, um, great poetry that inspire you about the courage and the bravery, uh, and and the and the shrewdness and the perseverance of the Indians, the Native Indians, who whom Longfellow admired. Uh, uh, you know, you, you, you'd absorb these stories, they'd become part of your heart, and you don't need somebody to tell you what it is to be a man. You've been told it by the poets, not to mention your father and your uncles and everybody else that you're hanging around all the time, but you've been told it by them your whole life long. <laughs> Isn't that a nice other, story, though? Yeah, that is one. It is a great story, yep. Yeah, both my daughters are having to... I I have it from uh, an article in Century Magazine written later by one of the boys who was there. Wow. um, Who who recalled the incident. Wow. (laughs) What an experience. Yeah, praise God. Yeah. Wow. Well, we could definitely keep on going. I am grateful for your time, for your wisdom, for you know the your book and books and articles. We're going to drop those in. Read a recent article that you wrote um, uh, on Crisis Magazine. That was a great one about the liturgy. And so I just want to thank you, you know, so much for bringing clarity again, wisdom, directness. Right? It's not fluff, and and that's so edifying and uh, and enjoyable to be. A, no, I, you know. I don't do fluff. Uh. No. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So again, thank you so very much for your time thank and for you. joining thank us today. It was, it was great fun. Yeah, and Sam, as we end every episode, be a man, be a saint. Thank you.